Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Idea to Value podcast interview. Very happy to have Stuart Semple with us today. Stuart is an artist out of Dorset in England and is a, become a, a bit of a celebrity in the artistic community at the moment because he's created the pinkest pink in the world. Uh, and that's related to a couple of the things happening within the artistic scene right now that, uh, that we're going to talk about today. Stuart, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very pleasurable to have you with us today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Um, so, for people who don't know you or what work that you, what work you do, could you just give us a brief background as to what sort of things you're up to and how you got into it? Sure. I mean, um, I'm basically a contemporary artist. I'm a visual artist, and um, that's been my job or profession, if you like, for about 15 years. So. Um, I'm predominantly a painter, so I make paintings and I kind of do exhibitions all over the world of those and um, I've done some public art projects, um, a piece called Happy Cloud where I let off thousands of smiley face clouds from the Tate Modern a few years ago that I've repeated around the world. Um, so kind of public art, painting, sometimes a bit of sculpture, um, but I use the internet a lot as a um, kind of a medium or a space or an exhibition area something like that um a way to engage the public um so yeah i guess from the painting side of things i've been developing my own paints for most of the 15 years i've been kind of painting i suppose um so there's a side to my practice which is very much about that alchemy and the creation of different potions and materials to use in my work and that's recently come to the forefront over the last, shall we say, couple of months, couple of years, because there's been quite a controversial thing that's happening uh, in the artistic scene related to one specific color of paint. Uh, could you just let us know what's happening there and uh, why it's a bit controversial? Yeah, sure. So um, basically, there's a company called Surrey Nano Systems out of the UK who've created an incredible substance, which is called Vanta Black. Um, this substance is the blackest black on the planet. And what makes it the blackest black is the fact it absorbs something like 99.9% .9 of all light. The effect of that is you coat something in this stuff and it almost looks like a black hole. It loses all form and all shape. Um, it's amazing stuff. It was originally designed to be used kind of for engineering applications, coating the inside of telescopes, looking into deep space, that kind of thing. Um, but an artist called Anish Kapoor, um, and for those of you who don't know, he's a really big artist, very important artist, makes giant public sculptures like the Bean in Chicago. Um, he got exclusive rights to use this in art, which meant that no other artists could work with Surrey Nano Systems on any other artistic projects. Um, although everyone else could, so graphic designers could, musicians could, luxury brands could, but only one artist could. And that didn't sit very well with the artistic community. They felt excluded, um, that it was elitist, and the fact that Anish had all this money and wealth and power enabled him to do it, and it wasn't fair on everybody else. So that kind of is what happened there. And uh, I, I've written an article about Vanta Black previously. It is a fascinating substance. And uh, yeah. if, if people are struggling to imagine what it's like, Imagine uh, that if you were to take any three-dimensional object uh, that has grooves and ridges on it, like, a, like someone's face, and you paint it in the substance, more or less no light can be reflected off it, so it just looks two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional, and it's a very, very strange sensation. And uh, as you said, um, this Vanta Black uh, is only now allowed to be used by one artist. Uh, but the controversy is a little bit between the fact, from my understanding, that you can only really use Vanta Black 
if it's applied in an incredibly precise sort of very scientific way is that the case yeah so that's also part of it um it needs to be applied by the creators they're the only ones who know how to do do it really um they're working on other versions that they might be able to teach other people to use but at the minute really sorry nanosystems need to coat your thing with it for you um but that's not strange in the art world we use fabricators all the time if you want to make a giant aluminium sculpture you don't make it yourself it's fabricated off-site same as like um bronze casting complicated picture framing a lot of installation work um, artists use fabricators or off-site technicians to make stuff all the time it's very normal in this day and age so what's strange about this one is that surrey nanosystems are refusing to work with artists but the the question then becomes is it not one artist's right if they are the first person to see something uh, and mm -hmm. and want to try it out for themselves to be able to say, okay, this is going to be kind of my thing. Uh, and uh, th th this is maybe where the, the controversy comes. I know mm. a long time ago, there was another artist who had his own color. I can't remember exactly what his name is, but I think it was Klein and he had Klein yeah. blue. And no other yeah. artists were allowed to use this. this Ooh, okay. All right. Okay. So um, two things. We'll talk about Yves Klein Blue in a minute okay. um, because it is interesting and it's very different. Um, and there's a lot of misunderstandings around what that actually was. Um, so we'll deal with that. Um, but the the first thing is, um, you know, just because you get their fur. I mean, the thing with art is everybody's got their own expression. I can give a stick of charcoal to my son and he makes a drawing. I can give it to Picasso. He makes a different drawing. It's not the substance. The thing with art is what you use it for. I mean, Anish Kapoor's work is Anish Kapoor's work. If Banksy made something with that stuff, it would be incredibly different so it's sort of to the art community like our side of it is he's trying to monopolize the material it's the material that's special not necessarily the conception of what he wants to do with it so we think this is a bit unfair because we've all got ideas of things we'd like to make with this wicked stuff and if we can afford to use it and work with sorry nanosystems why can't we um we see it as prejudicial almost as if someone opened a coffee shop and refused to serve artists in it there would be uproar it's very similar to that kind of thing um so we don't feel like he needs to monopolize it in order to make awesome stuff with it like my fabricators could make something for jeff coons damien hurst and me and we'd all make completely different stuff so you know and also that exclusivity doesn't go the other way so they're not going to work with just one car manufacturer or just one fashion designer so it's, it's odd like that um so that's our take on it i mean they've got other other arguments um and then looking at the Eve's Klein thing actually it was really different because he he created that color so Anish Kapoor hasn't created this color he's licensed the use of the color um and that particular tone of Eve's Klein Blue was a conceptual work like the color creation itself was his art um and he didn't actually patent it it's a misconception he went through the first stage of that and actually since then loads of people have used it for all sorts of things Anish Kapoor himself used it recently um and the blue man group use it etc so um it was a, it was a different thing um and i understand that you 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 obviously feel very passionately about this concept of uh wanting other people to be able to express themselves with this deep black um, and you've had an interesting way of uh, responding to it. Can you let us know a bit about that? Yeah, so uh, as I said, I've been creating my own materials for a long time. And one of them that came out of that creation process um, was a pink, a very specific pink that's um, what I call the pinkest pink in the world. It's incredibly pink. It's the pinkest thing most people have ever seen, I think. Um, and I had it and I thought, actually, do you know what? Um, I'm just as bad as him because I've got these awesome things I've made and I'm keeping them just for my own work. So why don't I put them out? So I put the pink out on the internet, um, almost as a piece of performance art, a piece of conceptual work. And I made it so that if you bought the pink, you had to sign a disclaimer that you weren't Anish Kapoor, you weren't going to share the pink with Anish Kapoor. 
um, and to the best of your knowledge, information and belief, it wasn't going to make its way into the hands of Anish Kapoor. Um, what that did was it kind of took on a life of its own at that point and people thought that was quite funny and um, it kind of caused a bit of a stir really and it kind of ultimately ended up with Anish Kapoor actually getting the pink and then he dipped his middle finger in it and he stuck his finger up on Instagram and then kind of out, all hell broke loose at that point. Um, and uh, do you actually have a sample for people who are watching the video? I know it's going to be quite hard to uh, do it over people listening to the podcast, but if you go to Idea to Value, you can see the video of the interview. Can, yes. can you see a bit of the pink? You can see the pink here. Yeah. Um, obviously, like, your screen can't show you the pink because um, yeah. it's too bright, but um, this is a pot of pink, and um, I just call it pink because I hate pretentious names for stuff cool things what they are yeah. you know a bean's a bean and pink's pink and yeah um for people who haven't seen it i'm wearing what i'd classify as my pink polo shirt and compared to that what you've just held up looks a thousand times pinker but apparently no one watching this video can actually understand quite how pink it is because the screens and the cameras that we're using to record color don't actually go up to that level of intensity is that right yeah, that's right. Yeah, a screen can't show it. And the other thing is it's activated when you add water to it. So what I've just shown you looks bright, but when you add water to it, it uh, it gets even brighter. So, yeah, I mean, basically your screen, the pixels can only go up to 255, like between 0 and 255. Um, and the other thing is pixels. This is interesting. It's all red, green and blue dots. And um, this is pure color. So... You don't see pure colour. That's why you need to go to art museums and look at real paintings because uh, screens can't do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been fascinating speaking with you about these specific colours, but I know a lot of people listening are probably very interested in your creative process as well. So can you let us know a bit about how you approach producing art um, and uh, sort of whether or not you have any steps you go through or what happens when you get a bit stuck? Can you just let us know a bit about yeah. how you approach that work? Yeah, as an artist. So, I mean, we all get um, creative blocks, I think. It's, it's part and parcel of the process. And if we didn't sort of fight those edges of things, I don't think good work would be made. Um, but I think for me it comes through working. I work through those blockages and the first few things I make after that happens, I've got to kind of live with the fact they're going to be a bit rubbish um, and then hope that something, some sort of momentum gets in. And um, once you've got momentum in the work that you're creating, then it kind of starts to take on a life of its own or suggest other ideas. And um, I'm one of these people who kind of believes that um, – the ideas are out there to be landed on us rather than we come up with them. It's not that I'm clever. It's just that I pick up on things and take action on them. Um, and I try and put myself in as open as possible space to do that. And um, tips and things that help me, I meditate every morning. And that gets me into a really open-minded space. Um, and I find I have quite good ideas when I'm more centered. In your mind, is it more about finding the right ideas or is it about then taking those ideas and and pushing through the initial, as you say, crap version and refining yep. it until it's something beautiful? Yeah, it's like it could be either thing. Like every now and then you'll get a flash of an idea and you're like, oh, this one, I've got one. And it's really exciting and it just drives you through whatever hell you have to go through to realize the thing because the idea just pulls you other times they're softer and they kind of evolve as you go through the process um and that's quite exciting as well because you don't kind of know what's going to happen so it could be either do you have any difference between the way that you approach work that's initiated by your own ideas shall i say your your own passion to create something and then work that you might be doing on behalf of someone else who's giving you the the framework or the actual idea that they want you to execute. Do you ever do work on behalf of other people like that? Very rarely. Um, very, very rarely. And uh, I have done in the past. And, you know, it's always come out really badly um, because, you know, we see things differently. And I, I find that um, I struggle to convey ideas before they're real. 
So I might be describing it, but until it's a real thing, everyone's got their imag- their own imagination or their own idea of what that thing's going to be. And actually, quite often, it's very different than what's in my head. And um, it can kind of distract from where I'm trying to go. So I quite like to make things and put them out there and just kind of see what happens. And I'm very lucky because um, my audience is an internet audience. It's not necessarily mediated through a gallery. So I have a very direct relationship with the people that see and interact with the things that I do. Um, and that's a really be- beautiful thing. So that's kind of the litmus test, if you like, of if something works or not. And um, I always have that in mind, the audience, make it for them. Speaking of the audience and the people out there who aren't necessarily artists themselves, <coughs> can we talk a little bit about the creativity of everyone and the creativity of other people because i know a lot of people that i speak to they they get very frustrated by their own inability to paint beautiful pictures or sing perfectly uh, or or dance or write a symphony and and that leads them to believe that they're not creative or not artistic mm. um, and that might then also lead them to not wanting to share their ideas in other forms of, of uh, either work or their personal life What's your view on creativity yeah. overall and whether or not people can either develop it, enhance it, or push through those things holding them back? Well, I think, I think the first thing is that we can talk about creativity or we can talk about self-expression, and I think they're different. Um, I think self-expression is really, really important, actually. Um, to create something, to share something of ourselves with other people is something that's intrinsic in us as human beings um, and something that, um, in a way, we've forgotten um, how to do. And it's things like the education system kicking it out of us when we draw a cat badly when we're five years old or me getting chucked out of the choir when I was seven because I sent everybody else off tune. It's, it's kind of there's a social idea that it's, you have to be good at it in order to be able to do it. Um, and I actually think there's something more important than that, which is doing it at all. I think doing it at all is actually really good for us um, as a species. And um, I don't think you have to be particularly gifted. I think that, yes, of course, there are people throughout history who are fantastic painters. Of course, we're not as good as Picasso. But does that mean we shouldn't share ourselves in some sort of creative way? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we need to connect with some form of self-expression, whether that's podcasting, writing, drawing, having a conversation with our neighbours. Um, it's, it's really, really important. And we find actually that people get quite unwell um, when they stop doing that. Do you ever feel the sense of anxiety that a lot of these people might feel before you are about to release a, a new painting? Or are you always pretty confident that, yeah, everyone's going to love this? I'm never, never confident. Um, I don't take it for granted. You know, I, I feel very lucky when something I did. I've done so many things that haven't worked, um, but I'm not scared of getting it wrong and looking like an idiot either, um, which is why I think on some rare occasions I've got it right and um, you have to take the rough with the smooth you know you're not going to get to be a good skateboarder if you don't want to fall off it just doesn't work like that so yeah you've got to get it wrong more times than you get it right Um, and every now and then you might have something that sticks or people enjoy. Stuart uh, we're coming up to the end of the interview it's been wonderful speaking with you. Um, Yeah and you. People go to find out more about your work or if they might be interested in your color or other colors. Yeah, so um, if you're interested in the paint and the art materials, then culturehustle.com is the place for that. And if you're interested in kind of my wider work, um, take a look at stuartsample.com, which is my website. Or Instagram, it's probably pretty good, Stuart Sample on Instagram. Yeah. Stuart, it's been wonderful speaking with you, and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. Yeah, and you, thank you. Today's episode was made possible by members of our premium deep creativity training program. For less than the price of half a candy bar per day, you too can get world-exclusive daily exercises which push your creativity past its comfort barrier to make you better able to generate ideas in all aspects of your life and work. Invest in yourself now by going to www.ideatovalue.com slash deepcreativity and using coupon code PODCAST for 25% off your first order. And don't forget that if you found this episode interesting, to like and share it, and to leave us a review in your favorite podcast player. See you again in the next episode.